Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Joshua, I think everyone here knows me. Uh, man, what a question. Do they see Jesus in me? You know, there's a scripture there in John 13. It says, all men shall know you. All men shall know that you are my disciples by your love. You know, I'm often accused quite a bit of a lot of things because you please some of the people all the time, all the people some of the time, but you can never please all the people all the time. And sometimes people say, he's like a lovey-dovey preacher. He's got that soft love religion. And I say, That's pretty good. if you think it's soft, I, you've never really loved anybody. You know? Love is a rugged thing. Like, yeah, love does win. My license plate says love wins. But it is not without scraps, and bruises, and battles. And uh, to really love people takes a supreme effort. It's not a soft religion. We have an interesting topic about restoration today. I have a burden to talk about it. Fully pray, yeah, I want to share something with you. Uh, this is a parable that we do sometimes. This is $10,000. It's not real money. That's a hundred hundreds, right? Uh, it says motion picture use if you could zoom in real close. So it's not legal tender. But if I offered you $10,000 to rake leaves with me for an hour, would you do it? Pretty good with money, right? All right, I'll do better than that. I'll, I'll give everybody here $5 million right now. It's only one catch. You can't wake up tomorrow morning. Do you want the $5 million? Well, it, it, it's just you can't wake up on fine with that. I won't go to sleep. Well, <laughs> the answer is no, right? Right. So then I say this. You're telling me that just waking up in the morning is worth more than $5 million to you? Mm -hmm. Start acting like it. Have joy that you woke up this morning. Be grateful. Yeah, it's early, but praise God. A lot of people didn't wake up. If you start your day with gratitude, you're likely to end it with well-being. If you start your day with murmuring and grumbling, the Bible says do all things without murmuring and grumbling and disputing. If you start that way, you're going to end poorly. Everybody here just affirmed that waking up this morning was worth more than $5 million to us. So we should be grateful. Uh, even though sometimes the camp meetings, the mornings are early and the nights are late, be grateful for all of it. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Thank you for this meeting, Lord. Thank you for this last day of the meeting. We pray for your spirit to be with us as we open up your word. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, would somebody be willing to read Romans 15 and 1? I'm going to talk about restoration because it seems to be a nebulous topic uh, with most of the Christians I know. We're really good at some things and we're pretty, let me just say it nicely, there's room for growth in other areas and uh, when it comes to correcting others we are like a number one God's remnant church at pointing out how everyone's wrong we are number one like waving flags but when it comes to restoring others we sort of uh, there's room for growth so we're going to talk about restoration because the brother in the back yesterday said how do you restore others I said I'll talk about it tomorrow morning would you read it for me real loud somebody Romans 15 and 1 we who are strong ought to bear the shortcomings of the weak and not to please ourselves. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities or the shortcomings of the weak and not to please ourselves. That's Christ in a sentence right there. Literally bearing the weaknesses of others instead of pleasing himself. And I would suggest to you that we can learn more about love by watching broken people pull each other along than we could ever learn by watching perfect people pull each other apart. God uses broken people to do wonderful things. That is the theme of my uh, ministry this week. It's the theme of my life. You know it's the truth. The Bible says it right there in a the verse. I have this uh, pencil, and uh, as I'm fond of object lessons and parables, I hold it up. Have you ever seen a larger pencil than this? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have some yeses up front. <laughs> All right, I'd like to see the pencil sharper for that thing. I ask people, what is this on the top? It's an eraser. I'm going to ask you a question. This is a true question, a true statement. 
Uh, erasers are for people who make mistakes. Is that true? Yeah. It's true, but there's a stronger truth. My mother used to say, good, better, best, never let it rest. Your good is your better, and your better is your best. Yeah. Some things are true, and then someone gets a little closer to the truth, and a little closer, and then they're right on the thing. Uh, erasers are for people who make mistakes. I say, no, erasers are for people who are willing to correct their mistakes. Uh, and it's one of the hardest things to do as a human being, to be willing to correct your mistakes. Uh, today, we all know people in life who make mistakes. Every one of us knows people who make mistakes. And that's the crux of what I want to talk about today. We want to explore the biblical and spiritual ministry of restoration. It's been said that strong people don't put others down, they lift them up. That's the gospel. Uh, it's an unfortunate truth that the Christian army is the only army that kills its own wounded. Somebody messes up the thing, we turn like piranhas and say, I can't believe he did that. And the people jump on the person and just rip them apart. Uh, the Danish have a wonderful proverb. It says, and you have to chew on this one and digest it to understand it. It says, when a tree falls, the whole village runs to cut the branches. You know what that means, what I'm talking about with a person. When someone makes a mistake, almost everyone jumps on and runs and cuts them and tears them. Yeah, he did that to me too, and this and that. Whatever you believe about the mark of the beast, whatever you believe about prophecy, I'll tell you this much. The angels know us by our love. And if you're the type that tears someone down who has fallen, it's not going to matter a jot or a tittle what you know about prophecy going to hear that horrible phrase from Jesus, depart from me, I never knew you. Because Christ is a redeemer. And if you know Christ, then you know the spirit of redemption. And that means Christ in you, the hope of glory, not just for yourself and for others. I'll tell you what, I know this much. I know that all of us are more than the worst thing we've ever done. All of us are more than the worst thing we've ever done. And People make mistakes, they make bad decisions, that doesn't make them a horrible person. It means that they need help, they need to be restored. On the Mount of Blessings, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. They're the only ones capable of it, but not just for themselves, but for others. They're intercessors, just as Christ is. Go with me to Galatians 6 and verse 1. That brings us to, uh, it's not really our opening verse, but it's kind of our important theme verse. Galatians 6 and verse 1. If somebody wants to read that out loud. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. That is an excellent translation. That's not the King James, but that gets the, that nails the crux of what's being said right there. Mine says, brethren, if somebody be caught red-handed in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. Now that is a wonderful verse. That can be one of the hardest things to do because uh, people can be rough. People can be abrasive. Do you know any abrasive people? Especially when they're wrong. People, when they're wrong, they're very nice to you, aren't they? Especially when you point out that they're wrong. Are they very nice to you about it? No. No, they're not. Hey, listen. The world is full of broken people. And we all know that broken things have jagged edges. Don't take it personal if every once in a while when you bump into somebody here on earth, they cut you. It's not their fault they're broken. And if you're not as broken as them, isn't that all the more reason to help put them back together, to help mend them, to help make them a whole? Now, the verse that our sister just said, read there, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, it says, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. And you know that word restore in the verse in Greek is actually the word mend. It's like putting that plate back together. It's to knit together, to join, to make whole. And the Greek word used there for restore gives the idea of correcting, and this is important, without any feeling of resentment and in, without any thought of punishment, but with the eye single to the restoration and the healing of the broken thing. 
That's what the word means in Greek. Now, it's not about punishment. It's not about uh, resentment. It's, about, uh, it's not about taxing someone and shaming them. The word says restore, and in Greek, it means your eye is single to the healing of the offender. Yes, they offended. Yes, they transgressed. Yes, they're wrong. Yes, man, this guy's done this seven times. How many times shall I forgive my brother, Lord? What's he saying? Six times? Seven times? And Jesus says what? And what is the immediate response? Lord, increase my faith. Because the faith that we need most is the faith to keep dealing with other people who are wrong continually. To bear those burdens. But those of us which are strained, strained, uh, strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. Now the word mending is the same word that Matthew and Mark use for mending their nets. Uh, it says they were mending their nets. It's the same word. It's, they're not punishing their nets. They're not resentful at this stupid net, you know, I don't know, maybe. But the main thing, they're trying to get it back in working order. You get that? And Jesus tells us to get those that are broken back in working order. But whatever imagery we use to picture this restoration, I want you to know something as we come on this closing day of the meeting. God can use you to do it. Now, God does it, but He can use you to do it. And I want each and every one of you to understand that not only God can use you, God wants you. He absolutely wants you. And if you ever think that God can't use you because you're not perfect, you haven't understood God. Just because you're not perfect doesn't mean you can't be wonderful. And just because you might be broken here or there, that doesn't mean you're useless. Broken doesn't mean useless. Broken crown still colors. Is that true? In fact, uh, I saw a kid break a pencil in half and said, oh no, and he sharpened it. He said, now we have two pencils. <laughs> Broken doesn't mean useless, and God is very wise about using imperfect things to do wonderful things. You know, there's a story that just destroys me every time I tell it. This little girl fell down a well over in Romania, an abandoned well, a 12-inch pipe, uh, 50, 100 feet down into the cold water. They couldn't get to her. And so they were digging and digging, trying to rescue her. These faint cries were skittering up out of the darkness, you know. And they dug and they dug, and at some point the cries became very faint, and then they were ceasing. And uh, they knew that it was not going to be a rescue, it was going to be a recovery. And when they got done digging there, they were going to go over there and dig another hole and put the little girl in it and have a funeral. And when all hope seemed lost, when all hope seemed lost, father pressed through the crowd with his son. His son was a skinny, lanky kid, like real skinny kid, I don't know, like almost comically skinny, you know? And he tied the rope to the boy's feet. He looked deep in his eyes and they stared in each other's eyes very strongly. He said, son, I'm going to lower you down. You're going to be strong enough to pull this child up. Be strong and be courageous. And the father lowered the son down that pipe. Everyone got dead silent up top, you know. And after a few minutes, you began to hear this clanging of steel down there. And they began to pull this red rope with all their might up there at the top. And they pulled and pulled. And then out burst this son. And there he had the child in his arms. And it was alive. The entire village rejoiced. Now, the thing that blows me away about this story, that kid, he wasn't the smartest kid there that day. And he wasn't the biggest and he wasn't the strongest, and he wasn't the most handsome or the best looking, but he was the right one for the job. He was the only one that could fit, you understand? And that's how it is with you. You're the right one for the job. When it comes to restoring others, you're the right one. As imperfect as you might feel, and as better as you might think someone else is, you say, oh, that person's so much better at speaking than me. That person's so much better at cooking. This one's this. You're the right person for the job. God is in the business of mending people. The first one that He will mend is you. And then He goes, go forth and help mend others. You know, the ancient Japanese, they're pretty wise about a lot of things. They have some wonderful proverbs. You know, when they broke a plate, they would never throw it away. Did you know that? They would take the broken plate, gather up all of the fragments of that thing, and then they would join it back together with gold. It's called kintsugi. Kintsugi literally means joined to gold.
Now, the ancient Japanese believed that this thing was far more beautiful than a perfect plate. You see, this has a story, a unique story of creation, of loss, and of rebirth. And then when they took the broken pieces and they joined it to gold, they mend it together and it becomes whole. And they believe this is a wonderful thing. Brothers and sisters, that's the gospel. God takes our broken pieces and He makes us whole when we join ourselves to Him. I suggest to you today that God can not only help you, He is sending you to help others. As uh, imperfect as you feel, nobody else is coming. As broken as you think you are, God says, you're my boy. I'm going to send you. He would like you to go out, and I would suggest to you that God uses broken people to do wonderful things. He even uses them to help fix other people. Now, it's God that does the fixing, but that doesn't mean that He doesn't do us. And I would suggest to you that broken becomes beautiful when you let God do the mending. God is capable of mending broken hearts. He's capable of doing all sorts of things. Now, here's something for you individually. My wife broke a mixer in our kitchen a couple months ago. It has one of those that you do like this, and it spins. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. She did that, and she turned it, and went, pew, shot off of there, right? And she came to my desk, and she gave me like a handle and the bottom piece. And she goes, here, can you fix this? And I looked at it and I said, I can if you give me all the pieces. I thought about that. God can fix your broken heart, but only if you give Him all the pieces. God can fix your life, but only if you give Him all the pieces. The real reason that people remain broken is because they hold back. God, I want you in this area, but this area is mine. You know, you hear that small voice and it says, no, 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 don't do that. Have you ever felt the frown of Jesus? where he smiles sometimes, and you can't exactly see it with your eyes, but you know he's smiling at you. I have this experience often. But there's also another experience, which is the frown of Jesus. You're doing something in an area, and he's like, this is my area right here. And you can just feel him watching with like a stern, not angry, but disappointed. God can fix your broken heart, your broken life, but only as you give them all the pieces. And that means when you feel that, you have to say, Lord, not my way, but your way. Not my will, but your will. Now the author of Galatians goes on to say something profound in the second verse here. First he says, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. In the second verse he says, bear ye one another's burdens, and what? Fulfill the law of Christ. Bear ye one another burdens. And the apostle is using this imagery of tr weary travelers on a journey. Where in the name of love, when somebody sees someone else that's struggling under a burden, says, let me carry that for you for a while. He says, bear ye one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now it is of primary interest to me that the scripture does not say, point out who aren't carrying their load well and fulfill the law of Christ. The scripture does not say, protest all those wrong churches and fulfill the law of Christ. It doesn't say, call out those who are stumbling under their burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. The message couldn't be any clearer. It says, help. Help those who are struggling. That's the gospel message of Christ. That's the law of Christ. And in a single verse, I'm going to suggest to you, we are confronted between the difference between Christ and Satan. In a single verse. You know, Satan doesn't lie nearly as much as people think. He may be the father of lies, but in fact, he tells the truth quite often. Only Satan tells the truth in such a way as to accuse, wreck, and destroy those that he tells it to. He'll use anything to hurt people, even if it has to be the truth. Satan points out the broken people. He points out those who are struggling. But he does it in a way that they'll be more broken as a result. He uses the truth to bludgeon people, to pierce people through, to hurt them. In fact, in the New Testament, Satan, I guess it's Satan, he's referred to as Diablo sometimes. Diablo is a Greek word. We're going to have a minor Greek lesson for a minute. You ever see that word diagnosis? Dia means through. Gnosis means knowledge. Diagnosis. And to look in and to see is what it means in Greek. Like So the doctor diagnoses you, he looks in and sees, right? Diablo, Diablo, 
means in, and blow means to tear apart. So Satan, uh, that word means to cast in with the uh, hoping to tear down. It means to try to reach in and destroy someone from the inside. And I would suggest to you that the destroyer would use anything to destroy people's souls, even if it has to be the truth. The devil has no problem calling sin by its right name. Not a problem at all with it. He's a straight testimony preacher. He does not care. He'll give you the straight, he'll quote the law, he'll bludgeon you to death with it, he'll bring a woman and say, we caught her in adultery in the very act of it. The difference between Christ and Satan is most fully seen when it comes to dealing with people who are wrong. Both of them are in the business of correcting people, but only one of them is in the business of restoring people. The supreme difference is there. Satan points out that others are wrong. The scriptures call him the accuser. In fact, it doesn't even say that he falsely accuses. In most cases, he's accurately accusing them. He did this, this, and this. You know, I saw it, and this is what the law says. What makes Satan Satan is that he stops there. He points out how others are wrong. He points out their faults. Uh, but he doesn't offer any real help with the guilt, shame, condemnation. In fact, he's doing it like putting someone struggling under a load, and he's walking up putting like more plates and weight on there, right? Yeah. He's trying to get them to crumble and be destroyed. Now, Christ, on the other hand, is called the Redeemer. Christ is not falsely accused. But when he points out how others are wrong, he does it tenderly and with the intention of restoring them. Who's heard this before? The surgeon cuts to heal. He doesn't merely cut, he cuts to heal, right? That's what the Redeemer, Christ, does. Now the difference is as wide as heaven and hell. In Zechariah 3, there's this passage about uh, Joshua the high priest, which really is uh, representing Israel as a whole. And they've been unfaithful, and God says, I'll take you back. And Joshua comes and it says, Satan, stand there, Satan him. That's what it says in Hebrew. Because the word Satan means accuser. It says the accuser stood there accusing him. He said, he's a sinner in all this. And God says, take away that robe and bring him a clean robe. And then he tells him very plainly, but go and sin no more. He says, if you will follow all these things, then you'll be my priest. But the difference is very plain. Satan points out that he's filthy trying to destroy him. On the other hand, Christ says, take that away and bring new garments. One of them is about accusation and tearing down. Well, he's correcting them, and he's very accurate. The other one is about redemption. Now, this is a sermon that was brought about because like six months ago, Stephen had a Bible study about uh, uh, how to restore people. We were just kind of free-flowing spiritual meeting about how to restore people. And I realized that there is a dearth of information on this topic that uh, Adventists especially, they can give you seven ways. I can prove you seven ways what day the Sabbath is. And I'm proud of that. I can prove the state of the dead 70 times seven. I, we, I'm going to win that argument. But when it comes to actually helping people who are wrong, crickets. And I think that's because they haven't seen it done themselves. They haven't had an example to learn from. And it's just easier to talk about the mark of the beast than to deal with these difficult situations of redemption and restoration. As humans, we like to ask the easier question, don't we? You say, man, I don't know what the answer is to my health. I think I should go running. That's a difficult question. What is the easier question? Do I want a candy bar right now? That's an easy question to answer, right? Well, you can ask easy questions, but you're gonna end up in the wrong place and while redeeming and restoring others is a hard question, it's the only question we're asking if we're Christians. Think about the uh, Levite, the Pharisee, and the Good Samaritan. Is it Luke 15 or 16? <clears throat> Levite, the Pharisee, and the Good Samaritan in the story. The Levite and the Pharisee had memorized the entire Old Testament. They were systematic theologians. They knew hermeneutics, exegesis. They were probably about ontology and philosophies. And they were just wonderfully masters of divinities. And they were trained up in the ways of academia. <laughs> Let me say a thing and step on some toes. Academia is not the religion of the spirit. It's academia. You go to college, you get your degree, and then the highest thing is for you to write a paper with a bunch of footnotes that's peer-reviewed and someone gives you a high five and says, that's the best paper I've ever seen. That's academia. 
There's nothing wrong with it, but don't kid yourself. It's not the Spirit of God. It's not restoring the drunk and the wino and the homeless person. It's not the actual Spirit of Christ. It's footnotes and academia and intellectualism. And it's wonderful in its place, but if we're not careful, we can be hijacked, and our life and our religious life can be something that is completely foreign to anything Christ ever did. The Levite and the Pharisee were surely academics. And I'm not against academia. I, I read books. I like $10 words as much as the next guy. But for, in spite of all of what they thought was their advanced ways of religion, they were actually regressing. Did you get that? Here's this bleeding man on the side of the road. I guess his fault. He went through there. He shouldn't have gone through there. And the Levite and the Pharisee believe they're very advanced with all their understanding of the Scriptures and all of their learning of words. But their advancement was really regression because they had lost sight of the simple compassion which is the heart and soul of the true religion of God. And here comes this uneducated Samaritan who exercises simple compassion to restore somebody who couldn't help himself. And Jesus asked, which one of these which one of these is approved unto God? It was the Samaritan. Well, we have every reason to believe, unfortunately, that the Levite and the Pharisee were lost. Now, there's a religion of words and arguing over of words, and uh, some people, that's the highest form of religion. Now, I've stepped on a few toes, and not maybe anyone here, but maybe someone online will see this and get upset with me. Uh, some people's highest religion is more or less confirming or denying whether something is biblical or not. And when they attend a meeting like this, they really attend more or less to listen carefully to either affirm that this is biblical or to strain at it and say it's not biblical. And so to a good, a good a week of religion is marking up someone else's paper as best as you can and showing all their mistakes, right? Like, he didn't say that right, he didn't do this right, he was off about this, and the... Uh, well, I tell you, how we think about religion is important. But I would suggest to you that a teacher who is uh, marking up people's pages and boasting, like I mark up more people's pages than anyone in my class, I would say probably not a sign of a good teacher. In fact, this is a sign of a teacher who has failed their students. If their students are wrong about everything, and you're proud how you can catch all these faults, and how all these errors are wrong, that's not a good teacher. That's actually a bad teacher. Something has gone astray there, in my opinion. But how we think about religion is important. I know a lot of reformers. They say, I'm a reformer. I'm a reformer. Some of them are very zealous. I'm a present truth reformer and all this, right? But if you start religion with that mindset of reformation, the reformer, pretty soon you view religion as something that's good for nothing but to be mended. Everything around you broken. This meeting's broken. And then basically you're going to conjure up a fault-finding spirit. And before you know it, you're going to become a fault-finder. Which is, again, uh, not to call someone satanic, but that's what Satan does. He finds fault instead of restoring things. You know, it's possible to understand without condemning. Is that true? Like you see someone that's wrong and you say, boy, that is wrong. But I understand why they're that way. And see who their parents were. Like I know the kid's story. Like I know the other stuff that went on. And you can understand without condemning. There's nothing easier in the world to condemn others. Many fools do. Any fool can do it. Uh, but to restore others takes real effort. And I would suggest to you that uh, if we're serious about restoring others, we have to go beyond this religion, which is just merely an intellectual religion of words. I'm going to use a $10 word, forgive me. Logomachies. Does anyone know what that means? Logo what? Logomachies. It means to argue over words. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of folks whose religion is little more than creeds and doctrines and logomachies and arguing over words, right? Uh, God bless this, the people, but I've heard people before um, who are completely oblivious to the Spirit of God because they're hung up on straining at things. One time I held a, someone held a door for me. I said, oh, thank you so much. And the person spun on me and said, no, you mean thank God for using me to hang that, to hold the door. And they were theologically correcting me for being grateful. 
Yeah. And uh, I thought, Lord have mercy. And yet, you know, that's a lot more prevalent than you know. <coughs> Can't see the forest for the trees type of thing. Uh, and arguing over words. And for some people, a meeting is little more than just listening to the speaker and like secretly competing with them. Like he's a little off on that. He's a little wrong on this. And he's wrong on that. And boy, I would have said it this way. And he doesn't know about that verse. Correcting others instead of entering into the spirit. And, uh, well... Inspecting syllables might give you something to do, but Christ did not spend his time inspecting syllables. He spent his time restoring people. Now that's going to, let me just say a thing, it's a little painful. We are apt to grab the cross at the softest point. Jesus says, pick up the cross and follow me. We are apt to grab it at the softest point. And I would suggest to you the softest point that we can grab the cross is inspecting the syllables of others, inspecting the creeds of others. It takes no real effort. It's like you know, a fruit fly inspector, you know? Christ says, I want you to bear much fruit. Why didn't we get fruit? Because we have so many fruit fly inspectors, you know? Like instead of bringing love and joy and peace and goodness and wisdom and righteousness and the very things which are the kingdom of God, we're straining at that sober doctrine. I would suggest to you if we get the spirit right, the doctrines will take care of itself. It will follow and train. I've seen it. True spiritual restoration, true spiritual fellowship is not helping others to learn to say something a certain way with their lips. It's helping them enter into the Spirit of God. Speaking to an older man in Tennessee, and he had been a Christian a lot of years, he was a gnarly Christian during the Jesus movement back in what the 70s or 80s. And he was talking about meeting, and he used a phrase, and it stuck with me. He said, we were in this meeting, and there had been some strife, there was some problem between everybody, and there's maybe like 100 people in the meeting, and we knew these brothers and these sisters, and they're not getting along. And he said that the leader kind of went up there, one of the main guys, and he was singing a song on the guitar about healing and restoration and about unity. And, he's, and then he said this, Jim goes, but nobody was entering into the spirit of the song. Said, and I thought I said, say that again. He said they weren't entering into the spirit of the song. And I thought, man, that's yep. The guy was up there pouring his heart out about loving one another in spirit and truth, but the people were more or less just dryly sitting there, like listening to the word. They weren't, yeah, it happens, right? We sing standing on the promises, and really we're just sitting on the premises. Someone's up there singing their heart out. You're not entering into, so what I might cry in front of everybody. God forbid, I wouldn't do that. Jesus is naked and crucified in front of everybody. You're ashamed to cry in front of somebody. He said, well, I don't want to blubber and walk across and hug the person I've been fighting with. I don't want to pray with him in front of everyone. I mean, that'd be awesome, but it would be embarrassing. And we were afraid to enter into the spirit of the thing and let God have his way. Like, enter into the spirit of love and of joy and of peace and of goodness. So the easier question is what? This is syllables. Well, I heard you said this about the feasts and Trinity, and technically, let me show you what the Levites said here in Leviticus 22, you know, and that's a cheap religion. It's cheap. You want to love people like Christ loves people, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you being embarrassed sometimes. It's going to cost you crying in front of people. It's going to cost... Christ flipping the table over. I was going to do this today, Lord. And the Spirit moves and you say, okay, Lord, have your way then. Have your way. Then do this thing. This person, this woman just said she got raped as a kid. We were going to, we were having a Sabbath school over the 2300 days and I worked on it all week long. And then 10 minutes in, the woman says she got raped. And she's bawling and there's confession and there's healing and the Spirit of God's moving and, and the guy up front goes, oh, this is wonderful. But, but we need to get back to the Sabbath school until the 2300 days. And the Spirit of God grieved out of the room. Grieved out of the room. So it's going to cost us something to restore others. It's letting God have His way. The true ministry of restoration starts in our minds. Let me say a couple things about what the ministry of restoration is not. It's not proving that we're right. And unfortunately, that's the highest mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Proving that it's right. I've actually heard people say this, and I trembled. They said, uh, we're number one. Like, you hear God's remnant church, and that's like a prideful thing. Yeah. And then they say, we're number one, we're number one. Proving we are right is not the ministry of restoration. Number two, 
The ministry of restoration is not arguing with other people until they agree with us. Like, who's ever heard this before? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Like, you know, maybe you heard this, a fanatic. Winston Churchill once said, a fanatic is somebody who won't change their mind and won't change the subject. Uh, yeah, you know, they're laughing because you know a couple folk like that, right? That's not the ministry of restoration either. We got one trick ponies that we have this little secret handshakes. I said this to uh, Jerry at the falls the other day. I said, you know, the Adventists have more, as many secret handshakes as the Freemasons. I mean, as many. It's just different. It's, it's like, so you believe this is uh, the one about the King of the North? You know, like, you know, oh, right, I'm on, King of the North. That's the highest form of religion. It's like, so what do you think about uh, what so-and-so said about so-and-so? And they're filling you out, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, there's kids over there not being ministered to. Yeah. What are we doing? Ministering to self, preaching to self about what I want to hear. There's Mary. She needs healed. She needs help. Kids need heal. They need help. We're making plates for ourselves. Like kids are going hungry. Yep. Spiritually. People coming into meetings broken, smoking marijuana, doing whatever they do. We're talking about the king of the north. Saying, we're number one. God's bringing the church. Grab the cross at the softest point, in my opinion. Restoring other people is going to cost you something. Jesus spoke to the condition. Steve said that really well yesterday. Spoke to the condition of the woman at the well. Spoke to her condition. He wasn't like, you know what I'd like right now? I'd like to do this, this, and this. He spoke to her condition. He met her where she was at. Well, if our highest pursuit in religion is correcting and grading the papers of others, we're no better than Satan. Because that's what Satan does. He puts as much red ink on people's papers as he can. But the difference is Christ. Christ is the Redeemer, the Restorer. You know, there could be perhaps nothing more tragic than understanding every word of the Bible, but completely missing the entire point of its existence. Mm -hmm. It'd be like having a fire truck and uh, studying fire pumps and studying fire trucks and creating theories about fire truck, uh, trucks and fire pumps and coming up with words about the parts of it, and then standing there in the front yard arguing about what the words are called for the different parts of the fire truck while the house burns down. Yes. Right? You know, it's true, you could take a net and go to the ocean, and you could scoop a fish out of the ocean. That's true, right? But you can't do it without leaving the ocean behind. And I know a lot of people, they're scooping facts and theories out of the Bible and they're leaving the entire ocean of Christ's mission behind. Yep. Amazing facts. I said, that's all you got, facts. <laughs> Ain't seen the gospel yet. We're scooping doctrines and arguments and things out. And we were satisfied with that. That's enough. I'm satisfied to be able to parrot a bunch of facts that someone told me to parrot. But when it comes to the little girl that came in here broken or the kid... To tell you something that happened at the park yesterday, this happens, stuff like this happens all the time. That little boy it was not with us, he was a stranger. His name was Abel. Did you all see him? Yeah. Got him a plate, sat with him. You know his story? Yeah, no. What was his story? Yeah, his dad just died. Oh. He was playing Russian roulette. Oh. Kid doesn't have a dad. Kid needs a dad. I can't be his dad every day, but I can be his dad that day. I can sit with him and say, you know what? I think you're an honest little boy. You're really smart, Abel. He said, I'm smart? I said, yeah. You know, you, you seem to me like you're the kind of kid that tells the truth. I bet you're going to grow up and tell the truth to people when they ask. I think I might. Restoration is going to pop up all over the place. You're going to have opportunities to help people. Sometimes we can't see them because we have like these veils over our eyes of other things which have supplanted what Christ sent us to do. We scooped out something out of the Bible. We scooped something out and left the entire thing behind. We scooped a word or a theory or arguing it, especially the one true God movement. Boy, that's like piranhas tearing each other apart over this thing and that thing. Is that true? Well, technically, and it's the men. Let me say it, it's the men. 
every once in a while you get women who are sort of masculine and they want to fight and beat each other up. But it's the men doing it. And they're arguing. They leave the entire point of Christ's mission behind. Not the net. And they're proud of what they caught in it. And indeed, such as these have their reward, Christ says. Uh, but restoration is about restoring others. Now, what can we learn from Christ in looking at His example in His ministry? Well, I would suggest you Christ spent more time healing people than He did preaching. Is that true? I think it's true. Uh, I got no warrant. Reading the ministry of Christ in the Gospels, I have no warrant to believe that His highest calling was going around confirming or disaffirming whether something was biblical or not. He was literally healing people literally transforming their lives through His sacrifice and example. <clears throat> now, here's a hard saying, and I'll be done with the hard sayings in just a moment, I promise. But those who are often most self-assured of how biblically sound their theology is, often share the least degree of union between their theology and their life. Let me say that one more time. Those who are most self-assured about how biblically sound their theology is often share the least degree of union between their theology and their life. I don't want that. I want Christ. I'm not saying we can't have both. The Bible is a wonderful book. It is amazing. I'm not degrading the Bible, but the Bible isn't God. God wants to be in you right now, and if He's in you, Christ is a very specific thing. He starts with the letter I. He's an intercessor. Christ is in you, then you're interceding for others. And if you're not interceding for others, Christ isn't in you. Now, that's an absolute test, but I believe that Christ does what Christ does. I'm just stupid enough or simple enough to believe that. That Christ does what Christ does. You know, Matt Dooley pointed something out. He said these people were arguing about the definition of sin, which, boy, that's been going on for a few millennia. And he said it was strange because they started arguing about the definition of sin and then they began to sin in the way they were treating each other, but they were justifying it because they had to get the definition right. I said, Lord, have mercy. But we've all seen that, right? We trade character for doctrine. We trade holiness for doctrine. Jesus says, if any man should do the will of the Father, they shall what? Know the doctrine. John 7 and 17. He says, if you do what God has said to do, I will show you the doctrine. He doesn't say if you have the doctrine, then I'll show you what to do. Now, I know Amazing Facts follows that model, and they've become a huge mega ministry. Millions and millions of dollars slurping it down. And there's a reason for that. It's a way to get easy success, and I'm going to say it, cheap success. But the success that God has, uh, successful and lucrative are not direct synonyms. Right? Uh, not to bash in other ministries. God bless them and God I pray for them with tears in my eyes. God bless them and let them do something great. Uh, but we settle for cheap and easier questions. And one of them is how can we get the most money or the biggest buildings or whatever. But successful and lucrative aren't the same thing. To me, successful is restoring others. Now, I would suggest to you uh, in the final moments of this sermon, I would like to share a few thoughts about practically restoring others. Stuff that I have proven helpful. Like, wow, that was helped me so much. Before I do that, I'll share something that happened. Victor was his name. He was in this Bible study six months ago, and he said something and it hit me. He said, you know, the problem with correcting others, he says, the churches don't correct anyone these days. And I thought, well, that's true. That's ha He had half a truth, and I had the other half. Because I've seen churches that never correct anybody. Right? That's a really easy way to go, right? And then I've seen the other churches who do nothing but correct anybody. They never offer encouragement or inspiration or restoration. They just tell you for 45 minutes that you're a sinner and your skirt isn't long enough and this and this and this. And it's just like the red ink on the paper. And I got praying about this and thinking about this and something, bam, it hit me. If our churches would be full, if our churches would have a revival, it will not be by correction or by a lack of correction but it will be by intercession. When the members begin to intercede for each other, when the Spirit of the living Christ returns to the church and begins to intercede, the churches will overflow. If the churches and congregations and Bible study groups and Zoom fellowships became a place 
where broken people came and the Spirit was present to intercede for them and restore them, I think they would overflow. You'd have people, it would be wonderful. They would tell everyone they knew, like the woman at the well, like, man, I had so many problems. My life got so much better when I went in there. Like, all of these things were changed. So it's not by correction or a lack of correction, but it's by intercession. Correction is cheap. Intercession is holy. That's the difference. God gave me another thing. I was riding with Willie Wolf through the Appalachia a couple years ago, and I had this moment. Me and Willie have wonderful discussions. And I had this, like, one-liner. Discernment is a gift of God. And God gives us discernment, not so that we can find fault, but so that we can make intercession. The only reason God allows you to see the faults of others is so you can intercede for them. If you're seeing the faults of others for any other reason, it's Satan helping you to see them. And he's a revealer of things too. God gives us discernment, not so that we can find fault, but so that we can make intercession. Now, I would give these practical thoughts, and I'd like to read a short but wonderful poem on the subject called The Records by Edgar Guest. Has anyone ever heard of that poem? Wonderful. It says, I watched them tearing a building down. A gang of men in a busy town. With a ho heave ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and a sidewall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled? As the men you hire, if you have to build? He gave me a laugh and said, no indeed, just common labor is all I need. I can easily wreck in a day or two what builders have taken a year to do. And I thought to myself as I went my way, which of these two roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by the rule and square? Or am I a wrecker who walks the town, content with the labor of tearing down? Brothers and sisters, if our own sins grieved us as much as the sins of others, we would be really in good shape. Tearing others apart is easy, it's cheap, and any fool to do it, most fools do. But it's not the way of Christ. I said something a, a year ago on Facebook, and I got just obliterated for saying it. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Please don't obliterate me. Are you ready? I said, you'll never, no man has ever become holy through pointing out the sins of another. I got obliterated by the reformers who told me I was wrong and that yes, you do become holy by pointing out the sins of others. I said, Satan must be the holiest creature in the universe. You know, I think that deep down the people who obliterated me knew that, that it was true, but it was also uh, something very inconvenient to their way of life. <laughs> right? Go with me to Galatians 4. That brings me to my first principle. Galatians 4. And I just have a handful and we'll be done. Here's some things when you're restoring others. Here's something to keep in mind when somebody's wrong and you're trying to restore them. The first thing to remember, they're not going to like you for it. They are not going to like you. No one ever likes when you point out that they're wrong. Even if you're trying to... What happened? I said not at first. Not at first. They'll like you later. Galatians 4 and 16. What does Paul say? Somebody read it if you don't mind. Galatians 4.16. Galatians 4.16. I'll quote it. He says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The quickest way to become someone's enemy is to tell them a the truth about themselves that they're not ready to hear yet. And uh, usually they're never ready to hear it. So when you're restoring others, one of the things to keep in mind right in the beginning, they're not going to like you for it. There's a wonderful old proverb, and I it's quoted, it's beautiful, it says, Men must be taught as though you taught them not. You have to be subtle. Like, you know, sometimes you have to use yourself as an example. Like, you see the guy with his shoes tied wrong at four and five, don't be passive aggressive, but it, 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 sometimes you can suggest something. You know, I used to tell them, I've been having problems with my shoes. I wonder if there's a better way to tie these shoes. And you work through the thing together, and the other person thinks he solves the problem. He said, Look, I figured it out. This is a good way to do it. You said, That's brilliant. I think that's great. Thank you. He's helping you, but really the whole time you were trying to help him. Men must be taught as though you taught them not. 
not that Christ wasn't direct, uh, but I would suggest to you that uh, unnecessarily arising opposition is a silly way to go through life. And the first thing to remember when helping others restore others is that they're not going to like you. Here's the second thing to remember. If you're living life right, your very presence will be offensive to some people. Is that true? If you're a Christian and you're actually not some holy Joe, you might be a completely mellow good dude. But if you're living a good and upright life, generally, your very presence is going to be offensive to people who are living wrong. So right from the beginning, understand where you're at. They're not going to like you for it, and you're going to be offensive to them. And they, oh, you think you're better than me. But really, that's the devil speaking from them. It's demons speaking out of their mouth. Because they're deep down convicted. You know, I know he doesn't lie, cheat, and steal. I've seen him do awesome things. I've done these things recently. And they feel shame. And shame often manifests like this. Oh, because they're offended by your presence. Because your presence brings shame on them. How does it happen when like holy angels come to men usually? They fall and they say, I'm going to die. That's the first thing men always say, right? And say, get up, you're not going to die. And I think because the glory of God is so strong that even if we're upright, when you're confronted with that kind of glory, it's just overwhelming. You feel ashamed, right? Uh, and I think the same is true if the glory of Christ is in your life. People are going to be offended by your presence. Here's another thing to keep in mind when you're restoring others. Jesus says it in Matthew 7 and 12 and Luke 6, 31. This is critical. If you get nothing else out of this, please take this. When you're restoring others, <clears throat> critical principle, treat others the way you want to be treated. Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He says it twice, right? When you're restoring someone else who is wrong, critical principle, treat others others exactly how you would want to be treated. Now that's called the golden rule, right? Who here learned the golden rule in kindergarten? I say no. You heard the golden rule in kindergarten. You haven't learned it yet. <laughs> if we're learning it every day. We're learning it every day. Christians learn the golden rule when they become Christian. Now I don't know one of them who's actually learned it yet. We're always learning it. The problem is we hear something like that. A principle which is dynamic, which is powerful, which is world-changing in metaphysics. Treat others the way you want to be treated. But we look at it and we go, well, that's so simple. All right, give me some prophecy now. Yeah. And all we did was hear the thing and we haven't learned it. And whatever you know about prophecy, whatever you know about what you think you know about Sunday laws, whatever you think you know about a revelation, none of that is going to matter a jot or a tittle if you don't treat others the way you want to be treated. Christ is going to say, that is a pillar teaching, depart from me, I never knew you. And when restoring others, you have to treat them the way you want to be treated. Would you want to be corrected and called out in front of a whole group? Would you like that? No. Alright, then don't violate the principle. If you got to restore someone, wait until the right time. Uh, you know, hey, let me jump onto that principle. Timing's important with restoration, right? Who here planted your corn in December up here? <laughs> Wouldn't do nothing, right? Or how about do you, 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 you like to, I like to plant my corn and then I go out and I plow afterwards. Timing is important, right? But I know some people that are clueless to this. Like somebody is having their worst day. Their father died, they're getting on the way to the funeral, the car, they got a thick temper and they cuss, you know? And on the way to the funeral, their father's shooting, they get a flat tire and they start cussing. And someone starts lecturing them about cussing on the way to the funeral. Like, heaping on at the worst time. It's true that correction is important, but timing is sublime. You know the best time to talk to someone and restore them? Is when you're having a deep heart-to-heart -heart and nobody's around. You're talking, you've really connected with a person, you're having this deep heart-to-heart, -heart, you're almost giddy, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. The Spirit of God's present. Uh, and then you... Then you say, hey, please, please, can we pray? Please don't get upset. I just want to talk to you about something. Nobody's around. Give them room to circle around. You know, I got a farrier. Farriers put shoes on horses, right? And I talked to this farrier. He's been doing it 30 years. He said, sometimes you get a kicker. You know what a kicker is? That's a horse that don't want them shoes. Now, he's only trying to help it, right? 
that's not his friend and doesn't want those shoes. And he said, the worst thing you can do when you get a kicker is tie it up to a post with force. He said, you tie that thing down tight like you can't get free and try to put shoes on, he said, I'll kick you to death. I said, what do you do then? He says, what I do, I go out in the field with it, and I hold it real loosely, and I try, and when it gets upset, he says, when it gets upset, I let it circle around. And after a minute, I try again real gently, and when it gets upset, I let it circle around. As long as it has room to circle around, it won't kick me, he said. The moment I try to corner it, it's going to beat me to death. He said, now I might take 50 tries until the thing circles around, but when I give it space and it circles around, eventually I get it. He's been doing this 30 years. I would suggest in your dealings with people, that's a wonderful principle. Give them room to circle around. Don't corner them in front of people. Don't go at them and, and well, you need to tell me yes or no. Did it happen or not? Give them room to circle around until they can come back when they're ready for it. God is capable of doing that. Here's another thought about dealing with others, and I think uh, with restoring others. Stephen said it uh, yesterday. We hit on it a little bit. Keep in mind that explaining is not the same thing as inspiring. And if you have to choose between the two, choose inspiring. You can explain to a drunk why drinking is wrong. You can explain to a drug addict why drugs are wrong. You can explain to people why premarital sex is wrong. And they may intellectually understand it. It will not change them. They have to be inspired. Before, they, before you can have something, you have to want it. Is that true? Before we can have peace, we have to want the things that make for peace. You know that verse says, Blessed are the peacemakers. You know that's like the final verse there. And it's like the golden clasp on a chain of verses. And all the verses before it are the very things which make for peace. A few years ago, we had riots everywhere and all that going on. And people said, let's have peace. I said, before we can have peace, we have to want the things that make for peace. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed. You have to want all those things to get the peace. But I always suggest to you that uh, explaining is not the same as inspiring. And if you truly want to restore others, you have to inspire them. And one of the greatest ways you can do that is by your example. That you've been there before, you've walked there before, you've gone there, that by your example, that's where the magic happens. A couple more principles, I'll close, I promise. Don't be a seagull. There's already too many seagulls. When you're restoring others, don't be a seagull. You know what a seagull is? So if something goes wrong, a seagull is uh, a person that swoops in and poops on you and then flies off without offering any help. They walk into the potluck, they say, wow, there aren't enough plates. Seemed like they'd have had enough plates. Walk right out. Great. Before you complain, have you volunteered to help? Don't be a seagull. The world is full of seagulls. Social media is full of seagulls. Swooping in and criticizing somebody's life without offering them any real help is a seagull. Like, they're not going to, hey, thanks for pooping on me, great. Hey, you know you got a flat tire? You're like, yeah, man, I do. All right, just want to make sure. <laughs> Great, thanks. Don't be a seagull. When uh, Jesus was baptized, it says the heavens were open and something descended on him. What was it? A dove. Be the dove. Hey, let's talk about a dove for a minute. Dove's a very peaceful bird. Is that true? No. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Enough out of you there. <laughs> a dove's a very peaceful bird. Pretend that these three in the back here, we're going to say Stephen, Benjamin, and Jean have been having strife. Now that's not true, but we're going to say they did. And they were trying to work through the problem. If the Holy Spirit is like a dove, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit's like a dove, that's true, right? Are you going to solve any sort of problem between people without the Holy Spirit present? No. Now you need the Holy Spirit, right? If you guys are striving... If you will imagine that there's a dove sitting on the table and that your tones and your words and your mannerisms need to be peaceful enough that a dove wouldn't fly off, very likely the Holy Spirit will be present. But if you start like, well, I didn't know that because if you were over there and that's what happened. Is the dove going to sit on the table? Neither is the Holy Ghost. We want the dove and we don't want the seagull. And if you're clapping and getting loud and all, that's not restoring others. That's grieving away the Holy Spirit. We say, but they won't listen. And see, 
Here's the other thing. Sometimes we match people's tones. Do you do that? Mm -hmm. If you fight fire with fire, you end up with ashes. Someone gets louder and louder when they're trying to talk over you. You say, well, if I don't get loud, they won't get my turn. Well, don't get your turn. You say, well, okay, this is, I'll come back later. Let them circle around because they're not ready to have a calm conversation. You can do that with your husband or wife, too. You can do that. You can say, you know what? I feel like our tone right now is not actually good and that the spirit's not here. So we're just talking about this. Well, we need to talk about it now. Well, I think we'll talk about this later. Now, that's not my wife. I'm saying, I'm saying any husband and wife, you can say, hey, we just wait until the Holy Spirit is really present and that we're in that right space to discuss it. All right, be patient. When restoring others, be patient. You get a mechanic and a bolt gets stuck. You ever see that? And it's like rusted in there because all that sweet Montana salt on the roads. Uh, and then he, the young, the young mechanics, he ever heard this? Young men think old men are fools. Old men know young men are fools. <laughs> uh, you heard this one. Wisdom is the comb that life gives a man after he's already bald. <laughs> well, I've lost my hair years ago, apparently. Uh, you have this... Uh, bolt that's stuck and the young mechanic goes in there and he tries a wrench and it doesn't work. What's he do? He's a, a bigger wrench, right? And then he gets the cheap bar and he says, I wasn't asking you to come loose. You know, he puts it on there and he's like this and then what happens? He snaps the bolt off. Snaps it off. And then he spends about a day and a half drilling and tapping some bolt which should have been a five minute job. Now the old mechanic, what's he do? He sees the stuck bolt and he gets the oil. Yes. And he squirts the oil, and he lets it soak. Is it interesting to me that the Holy Spirit is likened unto oil? Yeah. Is that a thing? Yeah. And you let the oil soak, and then he comes back, and he gets it loose after a day or two. I would suggest to you, sometime the best thing you can do is squirt the oil and be patient. Pray for them and be patient. Pray for them and be patient, and let it soak. And sometimes, two or three days later, they'll come to you. You know, the other day at the park, I think I handled this wrong. Blah, blah, blah. Just, now, don't tax them for it. That's another principle. When somebody admits they're wrong, don't tax them. Like, yeah, you were too. And man, it's about time you told me. I reheat your sins for breakfast, and I'm going to go over the whole chart of what you did the other day. When they admit they're wrong, be done with it. Like, hey, check this out. When you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, be quiet. And if you can't be loving and gentle and patient, at least be quiet. Like be gentle with people. When they come to you and say they're wrong, you're teaching them whether they should confess when they're wrong or not. And if you make it really hard on them to confess when they're wrong, you're teaching them not to confess when they mess up. Yeah. You're actually, the Bible says, give no place to the devil. You ever read that? You'll teach them to give a place to the devil when you're hard on them. They say, I don't want to admit I'm wrong because you're going to tax me. For you. I'm never going to hear the end of it. Throw it in my face 50 times. When somebody admits they're wrong, be done with it. All right, final, uh, final principle. <clears throat> iron sharpens iron, right? You know that verse? Iron sharpens iron. I have this knife. And uh, a few years ago, like seven years ago, there was a young man and he was more zealous than wise. And I was at his house and he was doing home church and he had making a fellowship meal. And he had this fancy knife. It wasn't this knife. He had an expensive knife. And I heard this terrible noise from the kitchen. Like, I mean like... <laughs> and I look and he has a can of corn and he's using like a $150 knife to open the can of corn. And I'm like, brother, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm opening the corn. And I said, brother, you're going to ruin the knife. And you know what he says to me? It's a true story. He goes, no, no. He goes, iron sharpens iron. It's actually sharpening the knife. <laughs> and I said, brother, I don't think you understand the scripture. He really believed in his heart that iron sharpens iron and that by doing this rough thing to the knife, he was going to make it better. But I would suggest to you that if you're rough with the edge of a knife, you'll destroy it. Iron sharpens knives, but actually only with many, and this is important, gentle and light strokes in the same direction. 
Iron sharpens iron, but only with many gentle and light strokes in the same direction. Some people say, iron sharpens iron. And I'm only being honest. They have no idea what they're talking about. It's foolishness. God sharpens people's countenances with gentle nudges in the same direction. You just cannot beat an edge onto a knife. I had a blacksmith camp back in March in Missouri. They actually do a blacksmith camp with the Christian kids, and I was watching. And the guy said, you cannot beat a sharp edge onto a knife. You just cannot beat a knife sharp. You know, a lot of Christians think you can but it's actually many, many, many gentle strokes in the same direction. Now, what are gentle strokes? To the wives, it's not nagging. Gentle strokes are not nagging. Like, I told you three times, and blah, 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 blah. that's not what it is. It's gently loving someone in that same direction until they're sharp. Final thought. The last thing to remember when restoring others is that restoring them has nothing to do with them deserving Grace has nothing to do with them deserving it. Redeeming someone has nothing to do with them deserving it. People are ugly to you. They just handed you a prayer request. I get a lot of prayer requests. Restoring others, if you're serious about it, has to be predicated on the understanding that them deserving it has nothing to do with it. They deserve to be slapped in the face. They deserve to be called out in front of everyone. They deserve to be beaten to death with rocks for adultery. They deserve wretched things, but He don't help you with that. Our verse said, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. Remember how Jesus dealt with us when we were yet sinners? How Jesus dealt with us tenderly and gently, drawing us on? And when you remember how He dealt with us, it makes it easier to deal with others. The final thought when restoring others, I would suggest to others, is always keep in mind, it has nothing to do with them deserving it. It has to do with Christ and His glory. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank You for this sermon. Thank You for Your Spirit. Thank You for this fellowship. Thank You for the sunshine. Thank You for nature and the beauty of the mountains. Thank You for warm Christian hearts. Thank You for mercy. Thank You for grace. Thank You for music. Lord, I have entered into your gates with the spirit of thanksgiving. We are grateful for all you've done for us and all you've done for us through Christ and all that you're doing now through his priesthood and the priesthood of believers that have Christ in them. Bless us on this final day of the meetings. We pray that you'll be with us as we fellowship. Lord, I pray that if you've spoken today anything to anyone here that you would water it, that you would make it salty so that they're thirsty for it, that you would bless it so it would revolve in our minds, that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for traveling mercies for those who are coming to and fro and for everyone as they go home. Bless us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.